Hello, this is Linda Rex with Our Life in the Trinity. I appreciate you taking the time to be with me today. Today we're going to uh, read some scripture together, pray together, uh, take communion toward the end. If you want to plan for that now, we'll close with benediction. That's kind of our uh, plan for this time together. Um, first, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, Son, Spirit, thank you for this time to sit at your feet, to think about what maybe you're trying to say to us through your word. We pray that we might hear, that your spirit might write in our hearts and minds what you have in mind, um, set everything else aside, and let us only hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our passage today is in 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 10, and then 14 to 17. Now I'm going to take a little time to read this in the New American Standard Bible. You can use your own translation. Um, and we're going to talk about um, what Paul is trying to get across here. When you think about him facing the challenges of ministry in a region and area and time where there was much opposition to him. And so he writes this, therefore, being always of good courage and knowing that while we're at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. He's thinking about um, the fact that he's still living this human life and he can't go to be with Jesus, who is in glory with the Father and his glorified human flesh, right? So he can't be there yet, but he's right now having to live and be at home in the body. And so he goes on to say, we walk by faith, not by sight. And he says, we are of good courage, I say, and prefer rather to be absent from the body and be at home with the Lord. So he's being honest about how he would just not have to, he would enjoy not having to go through the things he goes through in his physical body right now. And I can kind of identify with that. I'm getting old enough that I would like to just not have to deal with some of the things you have to deal with in your physical body. But anyway, um, so he says we walk by faith, not by sight. And this is what we want to look at a little bit today is the fact that we're living in the already not yet. We have that new life in Christ that uh, glorified human flesh that we look forward to, that's ours actually right now. Um, but we can't see it, we're not experiencing it in its fullness right now, so we walk by faith, not by sight. We can't really see it as we would like to, but we can trust in Jesus and believe it's there, it's real, it's ours in Christ. So we're gonna go on, it says, therefore, we also have is our ambition, and think about ambition, what drives us, what our hope is, what we're working towards, right, is whether we're at home or absent, either way, to be pleasing to him. And so that goes down into what motivates us in our everyday life, and is it being absorbed with ourselves, or is it seeking to please the one who laid everything down for us? And that's uh, where Paul is taking it here. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, according to what he's done, whether good or bad. For the love of Christ controls us. Some translations say compels us. It's what drives us, right? It compels us. The love of Christ compels us. It's not our fear of him. It's not our dread of the Father's anger. None of that. What it is, is the love of God in Christ. Love of Christ for us, right? Love of Christ, his love in us. All this, the love of Christ controls us compels us, moves us, or motivates us, having concluded this, that 
one died for all, therefore all died. And I want to look at that little sentence there. It's not even a full sentence, but it's like one died for all, therefore all died. That's significant. Because first we go back to who is Jesus Christ? Who is he? He is the son of God, the word of God, who comes, sets aside temporarily the privileges of his divinity to take on our humanity, to live as we live, to die as we die. What's the big deal? Because he's the one who made us and he's the one who sustains us. Whatever happens to him happens what to us and to all creation. So as he lives, we live. As he dies, we die. As he's risen from the grave in new life, glorified human flesh, we have that. We rose with him. So Paul goes on to say he died for all so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. So you find Jesus as God in human flesh, taking on our human flesh, the one who created us and who sustains us and gives us life, takes on our human flesh to live and die so that we won't anymore be living for ourselves. We had allowed, we were created for this face-to-face -face relationship with Father, Son, and Spirit. We were created for this stewardship of all he had made, to share that with him to live life with him, do life with him from now and forever. But sin and death entered in. And we began to live for who? Ourselves. We began to be self-centered, self-willed, self-driven, right? And what does God do? God comes in human flesh, lives and dies and rises so that we could start living for who? We could stop living for ourselves and start living for him on his behalf, doing things as he always designed us to do, to live in face-to-face -face union communion with Father, Son, Spirit, now and forever. So Paul goes on to say, therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Um, what he's saying there is he's pointing out that there that Christ took on our human flesh and he was known for a time as being uh, in our flesh. And John writes about how we touched him. We, we talked to him. We were with him. We saw him the way he was. He was human. And yet he was God. But but Paul's saying now he's he's risen from the grave. He's ascended into the presence of the Father. That's where he is now. And we just don't tangibly see him and touch him now. But he still bears our human glorified flesh. So Paul says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, creature, a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. So we find ourselves in this new place. The old has passed away. The new has come. Christ has done something that has changed things forever. What does that mean for us? Well, one of the things that I noticed, I, I've been rereading um, uh, Jeff McSwain's book, Hidden in Contradiction. And uh, he explains this passage and brings out the reality that a lot of times when we read this, the old things have passed away, behold, new things have come. We think of it in terms of one thing, and then this comes after that. But what we need to realize, and what's really hard for our Western thinking to do, is to hold both things true at the same time. We live in a paradox. We are still dealing with the old while we're in the new. I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, if we're truthful, we know that even though our heart has been changed, our mind has been changed, even though we have come to a new place in our relationship with God and one another, we're still messed up, aren't we? We still just can't get it right. And 
what God has said for us is our life is hidden with Christ in God. In other words, there's something true about us that's true right now, but it's not. We can't see it. We're not fully experiencing it. Right now, we're living kind of in this place where both the old and the new are true. And we have that new life that is ours in Christ. And we're still experiencing the sin and death that entered in back in, in the time with Adam and Eve and so on. We're still experiencing that. But one day when Jesus returns in glory to establish the new heavens, new earth, sin and death and evil cast into the lake of fire. This is burned away. What is left is what God has done for us in Christ. And so this is this is what Paul longs for and what we all long for is to be delivered from this broken, sinful flesh once and for all. But we're in this place where both are true at the same time. And so we need to think about, okay, if they're both true at the same time, um, this is why Paul says, keep our mind on things above, keep our heart on things above. In other words, quit focusing on how well we perform and focus on the relationship God has formed for us in Christ. That is the truth about us. That's the truth about us. So as we live in this paradox of the old and the new, like Paul, we yearn to be absent from the body and home with the Lord. But for now, we're at home in the body and absent from the Lord in the sense that uh, we're not quite there yet, right? We're living this out in this life. And we deal with the old that died on the cross and was crucified. And we are embracing the new that is ours in Christ. We experience these moments of transformation of God's kingdom, joy, and peace right now. They're just moments. They're glimpses. God is kind sometimes and says, hey, you know, this is what it'll be like. But we don't have it in its fullness right now. Right now we're still living where there's brokenness and there's sin and there's death and there's evil. And uh, we're participating right now in God's life and mission in this world, in spite of how far we fall short, in spite of how we just can't get it right. We like to focus on performance and on trying to be perfect and trying to, and God is saying, if you keep your mind on me, your heart on me, that's already yours in Christ and giving it to you by the spirit. You are a full participant in my life and love, embrace that and live that out and begin to participate in what I'm doing in this world. I think if we were so focused on living life with God in Christ, doing what he's trying to do in this world, we would be surprised how much our life, our behavior would change. But that's, we don't look at it that way. So we find what God has done for us in Christ, which is so amazing. It moves us or compels us to live that kingdom life out in this world, to start loving God and loving others the way we were created to do it. And living not on our own behalf, but living on behalf of God and living on behalf of others. And this is what we were created for, who we were created to be, those who live in other-centered, self-giving love, because that's who God is. God's love compels us then to share the good news of what he's done for us in Christ with others, not just in what we say, but in we do what we do. And this is our challenge because, because see, we still have that old self that died on the cross, that keeps crawling up out of the grave to annoy us and to create issues for us. But it's we're dead in that. We're new in Christ, and we can live in the truth of who we are in Christ by the Spirit. Just know that what God has done in Christ, 
what he's doing right now in his spirit, what he will do in his spirit, in Christ, in the world to come. All of this is God's heart of love for us. God's love is so amazing, so deep, so wide, so high, so low. God's love envelops us. And it's that love poured into us and from us that moves us to uh, share his love with others and to care for them the way he's cared for us. And that's a challenge for us. Our hope is in Christ in his finished work. He lived his life on behalf of us, on behalf of others. And so then he calls us to do the same. Just as God was motivated by other-centered, self-giving, sacrificial love, we want to be motivated by that. And by his spirit, we are motivated by God's love. We are motivated by God's spirit, his life in us by the spirit to do all that we do on behalf of others, on behalf of God. So we begin to turn away from ourselves and turn toward others. And that's kind of that concept of repentance, right? This turning, changing direction, so to speak, to, to be who we are, to live an other-centered, self-giving, sacrificial love like the triune God, Father, Son, Spirit. Because this is how they are. This is who they are. And who they created us to be, and to live this way in him. And this is our calling as human beings, as those who have been redeemed in Christ, to live on behalf of others, on the Lord's behalf, first of all, but then for the, on behalf of all others. And we struggle because we know that we don't always do this. And it's painful. I know it's excruciatingly painful for me when I don't do it the way I, I know I probably should. But we need to realize we're in the already not yet. And we're growing up in Christ. It's a process. It's a life. And we surrender ourselves to Christ and let him do what he wants to do in and through us by his spirit. And um, we come to the communion table, therefore, to receive a new Christ life. It's his life in us by the spirit that enables us to live in other centered, self-giving, sacrificial love. We're reminded of the essentials of our faith that we died with Christ we rose with Christ. We share in his glory, both now and forever. Thank the Lord. What a blessing and gift that is. So let's pray over our elements and let's take them together. Father, Son, Spirit, thank you for your goodness, your love, your grace. We receive anew all you've given us in Christ with gratitude and praise. In your name, Jesus. We offer our thanksgiving. Amen. We thank Jesus for his broken body. Thank you. We thank Jesus for his shed blood. Now may the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who died and rose again for all, that we may no longer live for ourselves, but for him alone. Bless you, keep you, smile on you, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, God bless you. Uh, do come and see us again on our Life in the Trinity. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our weekly blog. God bless you.